and I'm muting myself now. Should, should we should we go ahead? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, welcome Professor Richard Eaton to uh, this event on South Asia Heritage Month. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce you so that we can uh, begin the presentation as speedily as possible. Um, for participants, um, Professor Richard Eaton is a, uh, a globally preeminent social and cultural historian of pre-modern India. Uh, and um, he has written several monographs on the subject and plentiful academic articles on, on Sufis, on the Indian Sultanate of Bijapur, the growth of Islam in Bengal, the social history of the Deccan from 1300 to the 1760s. Um, he is such a preeminent historian that his CV is famous for having a section in it towards the end of works that have been plagiarized by other people and also containing a works of his that have been banned in India itself. So um, uh, handing over to you, I'm just going to ask you a quick introductory question, which is what was your inspiration for writing uh, this book and what scholarly goal did you seek to achieve in writing it? Well, thank you, Shapon, for the introduction. And, and uh, um, it's a great pleasure to be, it's an honor to be uh, invited to participate in, in, this, in this event. Um, <clears throat> So to the question, uh, what was my inspiration in writing the book? I think the shortest answer is that for in my whole career, I've been kind of interested in the interaction between Iran and India, uh, between Islam and, and Indian religions, and uh, the whole question of conversion and the rise of Islam. Uh, most of my books deal with that. But in the last five or 10 years, I became increasingly um, unhappy with a focus on religion alone. And I increasingly began to understand that a, a, a singular focus on religion is perhaps misplaced. And uh, a book came out by a colleague of mine, Sheldon Pollock, on uh, what he calls the Sanskrit cosmopolis, in which he foregrounded the notion of language and literature rather than religion as kind of being the key to understanding uh, the, the, the very heart of, of Indian civilization and Indian culture. Uh, not that that excludes religion, obviously, but it, it, it certainly includes that. But when I began to think about Islam, it, it occurred to me that actually this idea of using literature and language rather than religion might be a more useful and actually more honest way of looking at India's rich historical heritage. Uh, and I, basically, in a nutshell, I, I understood the, the interaction between, between uh, uh, Indian and, and, uh, and, and Iranian and uh, Persian language as being the key to understanding this, this 800 years that this book is concerned with. And the analogy that I would use uh, is that of the Hellenistic world from roughly the period of Alexander down to Constantine. The map you see here shows the diffusion of, of Greek culture, but not Greek political system. Uh, and we have here, in other words, not a unified state, but a, 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 a kind of a, a, a broad area where people subscribe to Greek language, Greek literature, uh, Greek theater, Greek sculpture, uh, and that diffuses as far east as India. So you see these two classic images of, of the Buddha. Uh, 
Eastern India on the right uh, and on the West it, it showing a very a, a great degree of, of Greek uh, aesthetic influence, uh, also in the image of the Buddha. And these two images, it seems to me, tell us a great deal about the diffusion of Greek culture, uh, even though uh, Greek religion necessarily is not at all involved. So this uh, image of Hellenistic culture, I, th I thought was another useful way of thinking about India, uh, where you have a similar diffusion of, of these two systems. Now here's a slide showing the Persian world from roughly 900 to 1900. And the cities you see depicted here are all sites where Persian literature, uh, Persian culture were patronized and were produced. Uh, and it is really the circulation of Persian literature through these various cities across almost a thousand years of time that, that, that constitutes what I'm calling the Persian world. Uh, and what's fascinating to me is that in the period that I'm interested in from roughly 1000 to 1800, there is this overlapping of the Persian world with that of the Sanskrit world that had already obviously been there and which indeed itself diffused far to the east. As you see in the map here, the Sanskrit world diffused all the way into Southeast Asia. I mean, you have words like Singapore or uh, the, the, or, or Sumatra, which are pure Sanskrit words, which indicate a great deal about this, this earlier diffusion. So what India it really, uh, one way that I'm thinking about Indian history is the idea of the overlapping of these two linguistically defined and literary defined civilizations, the Sanskrit and the Persian. Uh, and, and that really was the inspiration of, of this whole thing. Um, now, if, if I may just intervene. Sure. If, if, if I just may intervene there, I, I wanted to, you mentioned Sheldon Pollock's uh, concept of the Sanskrit cosmopolis. Yes. Um, could you please just give us a brief definition of what you mean by the Persian cosmopolis? It's analogous. Uh, in both the Persian and the Sanskrit cosmopoli, what they were really both consisted of is a body of literature and texts which were carried by a, a language that had enormous prestige. Uh, in the case of Sanskrit, as we know, it's believed to have been brought down by the goddess Saraswati, uh, a, 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 a language which itself was divine, was, was patronized by elites and had enormous geographical reach, as you see here in this map. So the Persian and Sanskrit were both languages that were not languages of, of region, uh, like let's say Bengali or Tamil or, or Gujarati, um, but rather languages that traveled, languages that were understood as elite, like Greek was. In the Hellenistic world that I spoke of a moment ago, the Greek language was patronized across this wide swath of land, kind of above and over these regional languages, which of course persisted. So you really are talking about a contrast between regional culture, where you have a, a, your, the language you speak at home, uh, your, your, your mother tongue, as opposed to this other culture, which is above it, uh, this literary la language, uh, which oftentimes serves as a model ultimately for regional languages. And that, so there's an interaction between not only these two elite languages, Persian and Sanskrit, but also between both of them and these, these regional cultures. So basically to answer your question, uh, the Sanskrit world and the Persian world are both defined by bodies of literature which traveled across area and which provided a model of both uh, social order and, and cultural power. That's basically what, 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 what we're looking at here. So um, to, to, the, to continue then, uh, another reason I wrote this book was because as we all know, in 2014, Prime Minister Modi comes along and he would refer to the period that I'm talking about as 1200 years of slavery, Gulami. And it's fascinating if I've underlined the words in his own uh, Hindi uh, speech there, that the words themselves that are underlined are Persian words. So there's a great deal of irony in the sense 
that at the very moment when Prime Minister Modi is vilifying what he describes as a period of slavery, you can see the influence of Persian culture in the very words that he used. Just, just to pause you there, Professor Eaton, could you please elaborate what he meant by Ghulami here? What did he mean by slavery? Well, Ghulami is a, Ghulam is an Arabic word, which was then brought into Persian, which was then brought into Hindi. Uh, and it was a term used to uh, refer originally to Turks who were um, recruited from Central Asia and brought into India in the 13th century, first by the, the well, under the period of all the way back to Ibek, the beginning of the Delhi Sultanate, uh, you had these, these slaves who were called Ghulam, uh, who, were, who were defined as a slave in the sense they had no, uh, they, 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 were, they were removed from their, their next of kin. They were uprooted from their family in Central Asia and brought in as military slaves. So the word Ghulam originally meant a military slave, people who were recruited for their military skills to serve the Sultanate. Uh, now, Modi is using the word in a more general term uh, because the word slavery obviously is a, has a very wide semantic range, uh, and he simply sees it as servitude, uh, which of course is also true. I mean, a Golami also means that, but an original meaning uh, meant a Turkish military slave. And, and in, in this in this relationship of servitude, whom does he believe is serving whom? Well, he clearly is re equating here uh, the idea of uh, slavery as being. Uh, the master is being Muslims, as he, he would use the word Islamic, uh, and the non-Muslims would be the slaves in, in his understanding. I mean, this is the kind of the the, the, the the message I think that he's conveying in this in this in this phrase. My only point being that there's a great deal the, the irony that so many of these words in his that he's using here are in fact Persian. And that only points to the extent to which it was Persian language, which had already infiltrated so much of, of, of India uh, by, by the 21st century. And, and I suppose relevant today is the fact that, the, uh, that Prime Minister Modi um, laid the foundation stone of the new Ram Mandir in Ayodhya, which yes. was itself, uh, which itself is being built upon the destruction of the Babri Masjid in 1992 which That's I'm sure we, will, we, we can now come on to a little bit when discussing uh, temple desecration. Yeah, so I'll come on to that right now. And I want to I want to say here, there's a, there's a very ironic sense of continuity between the post 12th century and the pre 12th century periods. The, the Turks arrive and begin to rule in North India uh, toward the end of the 12th century, around 1204, uh, the beginning of the Delhi Sultanate. Now, what you have here is a statement made by the Maharaja uh, Someshvara III of the Chalukya dynasty of Kalyana in the Deccan in South India, where he's, he states very clearly that the, animals, the enemy's capital city should be burned, the palace of the king, beautiful buildings, palaces, princes, ministers, high-ranking officers, temples, streets with shops, horse and elephant stables. In other words, to the destruction of temples, not any temple, but the temple that is associated with a king. Those are the temples that were politically charged and which had to be destroyed in order to uproot the claims of sovereignty of your enemy. So for roughly 700 years before the coming of the Turks, uh, you have repeated instances of royal temples being desecrated by enemies because this is what you had to do. Uh, a temple was, a, a royal temple was a site where a king uh, projected his claims to sovereign authority. And if you would need to defeat that king, uh, defeating the army is not sufficient. You need to uh, desecrate the temple. And the most typical way of doing that was by simply removing the, the, the murti, the image, of the state deity, the, the Rashtra Devata, uh, the deity that was understood as ultimately the sovereign, because in this formula, the king is only serving the deity, because it is the deity who is ultimately sovereign. The king is only serving that deity. So 
this practice of destruction of temples, we see, for example, or not destruction necessarily, sometimes they were destroyed, but most typically they were simply desecrated by removing the image. Now here we have a bronze image of Nataraja taken from Bengal, uh, patronized by the Pala dynasty, by uh, Rajendra Chola in the early 11th century, brought down to Tamil Nadu, where it still remains today. So this is an illustration of the idea of simply removing the icon, the Murti, from the temple uh, to your own territory. Uh, on the other hand, temples that were no longer being patronized by the 13th century, these were left alone. This is a very important point. Uh, here we have the state temple of the Chandala dynasty, uh, which would have housed the image of the deity understood as sovereign over this particular territory, the Chandala territory in the middle Ganges region. Uh, this was built around 1000. By the time the Turks reached this area in the early 13th century, this temple is no longer active, which means that it does not need to be desecrated. Uh, it's like a light bulb which has gone out, which no longer works. Um, the dynasty is over. Uh, the temple, therefore, is not, not an active uh, political center, and it has no political meaning. And the same is true in South India. In the Deccan Plateau, uh, you have, for example, the, this, this uh, state temple of the Kakatiya dynasty uh, dedicated to the god Shiva in Hanumakonda. It's the so-called 1,000 pillar temple. And this was active until roughly 1200. After 1200, this temple was no longer active, just like the temple in, in uh, Kajaraho, the Chandala that I mentioned a moment ago. This temple was not destroyed. It was not harmed. It was not damaged. When the Turks reach south in the Deccan Plateau, this temple is left alone, just like the temple in, in Kajaraho. On the other hand, the temple in Warangal, which is only a few miles away from Hanumakonda, uh, in the early 14th century, that was the royal temple. So when Ulu Khan, who becomes Sultan Muhammad bin Tughluq uh, in 1325, when he reaches this area, this temple is completely destroyed. Uh, all you see left is this empty square in the middle uh, of, of, a, of an area defined by these four tornas or, or, or majestic gateways. So what's fascinating then is only three years later in 1326, the same man who Ul Khan, let me go back, yeah, Ul Khan who destroys this temple to Shiva because that was, Shiva was the, actually Swayambhu Shiva was the incarnation of Shiva who was understood as the sovereign over the Kakatiya state that whole temple was destroyed. Three years later, Ulu Khan becomes Sultan Muhammad bin Tughluq. Now he's got to restore a Sh another Shiva temple in Kalyani, uh, which had been damaged. And what's extraordinarily interesting about this is that now the temples have become state property. And it is the obligation of a ruling Sultan to protect all state property, including temples. So what you have here is a Sanskrit inscription ordering the restoration of a temple, of a Shiva temple uh, in the city of Kalyana, which is within the sovereign territory of the Delhi Sultanate. And the inscription includes, as you see here, the sun and the moon, uh, the same way that, that, that a Chalukya period temple or inscription would have, been, would have appeared. Uh, indeed, the Sultan himself is described as a Maharaja Dhiraja Sri Suratana, uh, referring to Sultan Muhammad bin Tughluq. Now, all of this needs to be seen. You brought, you raised the question, Shapon, of the what happened today in Ayodhya uh, when the Prime Minister of India laid the first brick of what will be uh, this proposed Grand Temple of, of Ram. Uh, the Ram Mandir on Ayodhya, Ayodhya. And what he said today is the whole country is in the spell of Lord Ram. Uh, 
So in a very interesting way, what's interesting, to, what's, what's significant about this to me is that in effect, the prime minister of India seems to be suggesting that this particular temple is in, in a way analogous to say the, the temple at Kajaraho under the Chandolas or the Shiva temple, the Swambhu Shiva temple in, in, the, in the Kakatiya state, where in a sense, Lord Ram in this instance is the Rashtra Devata or the deity of the state. Uh, meaning that this state is not just, this temple has not just religious significance, but also very deep political significance because it's harking back to a, a, a period in ancient India where these royal temples were understood as sites where royal authority was established uh, and, and, and contested. Uh, and in some cases, as we've seen, uh, uh, removed by the simple fact of, of, of taking the, the Murti out of that by an enemy. If so I, this, if, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to ask here that you're offering a very um, pragmatic analysis of temple destruction. Um, and I was wondering whether there was any, whether there was ever any ideological element to the policy of temple destruction and the removal or the, or the destruction rather of, of patron deities and their uh, transfer to other seats of power. Was this ever, sorry. Yeah, yeah I, my answer is no, apparently not because the, the temples that were typically desecrated by the Turks were not ordinary village temples, okay. which are found everywhere in India, always have been and obviously still are. But rather the temples that were targeted were those temples that were patronized by enemies of the state. Uh, and that's the pattern that we find throughout Indian history from the 12th century all the way down to the, through the Mughal period. Um, and that's a very important distinction because the, the temples that really mattered politically were those temples that were patronized by the state in the same way that we have now seeing, in a sense, uh, Narendra Modi is, is reviving uh, an ancient practice, this idea of associating one deity with the entire state and symbolized as we see here through this idea of, of, uh, of a state temple. I, I suppose it is consistent though with a, uh, a pragmatic understanding of temple desecration to say that enemies of the state could still be perceived in, through a religious lens. Of course they could, uh, and they no doubt were. Uh, and I and there's we have evidence of that in in contemporary chronicles, but I'm just saying from a pragmatic standpoint, if we look simply at what temples actually were destroyed or desecrated uh, by whether by Hindus or by Muslims, doesn't matter. Uh, in both cases, the temples that were that were desecrated were those that were associated with a ruling power who was perceived as an enemy. Right. So. Moving along, that's one form of continuity. In other words, I'm suggesting that the, that the pattern of temple destruction of the Turks had a certain continuity with pre-Turkish practice, uh, whereby for 700 years or so, from at least the fifth or sixth century, uh, Hindus had been desecrating one another's royal temples. And that's what continues under the Turks. What also continues under the Turks is what I would call numismatic continuity where the coinage, now here you have, for example, on the top, you have the, the coinage that would have been used uh, in North India under the, under the Chohana uh, Rajputs. Uh, this was a dynasty that was overthrown by Muhammad of Gore uh, in 1204, actually 1192 and 93. Uh, but when he comes into power, what's interesting is to look at the coinage because he's ruling not just North India, but also Afghanistan, Khorasan, and Central Asia. And the coins that he's issuing for circulation in Afghanistan, Central Asia, and Khorasan are, have the traditional Islamic uh, program on them. You see on the lower left, those gold coins, uh, which have the name Muizadeen, which is the name of, uh, of Muhammad of Gore. At the same time, in North India, the coins that the same sultan is circulating are seen in the lower right hand, which have uh, not only the, the Devanagari script instead of Arabic script, 
where his name is, is, is seen, but also the image of the goddess Lakshmi, which is exactly the same kind of thing that we had uh, under the Chohana Rajputs. So I'm, what I'm arguing here is that as soon as they actually conquered North India, the Turks immediately appealed to tradition, which in this sense was coinage, because everybody sees coins. Uh, they are being passed around all over the state. And for economic reasons as well, you know, you want your bankers to acknowledge these new coins. And the best way to get them to acknowledge them is by repeating the same program, the same kind of images on the new coins as were already familiar in the earlier coins. I just uh, um, go, go, go ahead before we before we proceed. I just want to challenge this notion of continuity because, in yeah. the book itself, you you note how uh, both Sanskrit and Persianate uh, chroniclers uh, they had differing perceptions of the degree of continuity, but True. in in terms of both the cultural and the political. So I was wondering if you could elaborate upon that and what sort of differences do we see uh, in right. terms of the contents of those chronicles. Yeah, I think it's a very good point, and I'm glad you raised it, Shafom. Uh, the chroniclers are essentially ideologues who have an agenda. Uh, we know that because they make it very clear what they're trying to do. They're serving a king, that's for sure, uh, but they have their own agenda. Kings, on the other hand, have to rule over a, a large population and keep everybody happy. So what I want to argue is that, yes, there is a clear difference of perception between uh, Sanskrit and Persian chronicles that might be appearing at this time. But when we come down to the pragmatics of things like coinage, what we see is, uh, is greater continuity. Because the coins are things which ordinary people see and use every day. Whereas the Chronicles were only written for a very small elite people. Uh, very few people, the common people in India were not reading Persian Chronicles, but they certainly were using coins of, of this kind. And that's the point that I would, would, would stress here. Okay, another major theme of this book has to do with Timur uh, or Tamerlane as he's known and was known in Europe from the 16th century forward. Uh, and of course, he conquers Delhi in 1398-99. He, he does not stay there. He goes back to his capital in Central Asia and Samarkand. Uh, but he leaves behind him a certain style of kingship and authority uh, and lavish patronage of Persian uh, aesthetic vision. So on the left, you see his own great palace, uh, the shah -e sabs uh, or the Aksara, as it's known, the Palace of Timur. Uh, it originally was, was, had an arch over the top that's destroyed, as you see, it didn't last, uh, but very ambitious architecturally. And that model of architecture with its with glazed tiles, freestanding, spectacular monuments, very tall so they can be seen from a distance, this kind of thing is repeated all over India uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is in, in the Deccan capital of uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Bahmani dynasty in Bidar. Uh, Mahmoud Gawan, who himself came from uh, Central Asia, Iran, uh, as a prime minister, uh, builds this madrasa, and you can see uh, a very clear, distinct similarity aesthetically between the kind of the, the, the arch. Uh, just, just, just to pause you there, Professor Eaton, if you could just offer a definition of a madrasa for uh, people who might not know what that is. A definition of what? Uh, a madrasa, just to explain to people oh, who might not be familiar oh, with sorry. the terminology. A, a madrasa is simply a, a school. Uh, in this case, what, what, what Mahmoud Gawan wanted to do was to attract the best and the brightest from, the, from Central Asia and the Middle East. He invited great Persian poets like uh, like Jami from Herat uh, to come, he didn't succeed. He never showed up. But but he, but by building structures like this madrasa, he was hoping that the the most the brightest luminaries of Persian culture in terms of literati and poets and historians and whatnot would come to Bidar uh, and at, to this madrasa to this college. Uh, so it was an educational institution that we have 
Uh, okay, so my the point I want to come to is if it's interesting is that this I, this aesthetic vision of Timor, uh, of arches, of domes, of uh, of, of vaulting techniques were were very contagious. They were picked up all over the place in India, uh, and they were not used only by Turkish or Muslim rulers, but also by by Hindu states such as Vijayanagara. I just I, on on that point, Professor Eaton, I was wondering. I think you're just about to go on to this theme about how the, the cultural spread was also voluntary. It wasn't necessarily always through the through the didactic relationship of state patronage. It could also be um, uh, voluntary on the part of, of Hindu kings. And exactly. I suppose this is the context in which you're now discussing. Yes, yes. yeah. When I say contagious, uh, I mean, it's very much literally, we're li now we're all living in the age of, of COVID-19, uh, which has its own way of moving around. Well, the same thing is true with uh, elite styles. Uh, this architecture you're seeing in the upper left-hand corner, which is nothing more than a government building uh, in, in 15th century Vijayanagara, uh, is, is borrowing architectural engineering techniques, which were already brought to India uh, centuries earlier by, by, by Turks. It was obviously ultimately a Persian uh, image, but you have the domes, the arches, uh, freely displayed in, in, this, in this kind of architecture, not imposed, but rather in emulation. Again, it goes back to that, that Hellenistic world that I spoke of a moment ago, where you saw a Buddha appearing in what looked like Greek clothing. Uh, the Hellenistic world had this, idea, this aesthetic vision that was very contagious and which had enormous geographical reach across uh, Central Asia and including India. So here again, we see uh, the, the Maharajas of Vijayanagara borrowing this, this kind of international, highly, pre very prestigious style of architecture and assimilating it into their own capital, as you see here. What's ironic is, at the same time, they were employing lots of Turkish warriors to, uh, as part of the military corps, who were obviously Muslims. And so we find in the lower part of the same slide, a mosque uh, built by an Ahmed Khan, who apparently was one of these Turkish uh, warriors who, 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 who built this mosque, but he built the mosque in traditional Vijayanagara architectural style. So there's an interesting way in which uh, both Hindus and Muslims in Vijayanagara are borrowing traditions of architecture and aesthetic vision that were not originally native to their own air regions. Um, and it's images like this, which I think point out the mistake of talking about something like Islamic architecture or Hindu architecture, because anyone who didn't know better would assume that the above image is Islamic and the one on the bottom is Hindu, or, or as a point of fact, you're seeing a very different kind of uh, phenomenon in terms of uh, how they're being used. Um, d d go ahead. Sean. No, no, no I, I, I think my question would fit better after the following slide. Okay, yeah, because I'd also at Vijayanagara, you see in the 14th century, uh, on the left-hand side, you see a hundred column hall, uh, which has no precedent in Hindu kingship at all in traditional India. But it certainly does in Persian understandings of, of monarchy and, and imperial power. Uh, on the right hand side, you see a ground plan of the ancient Persian capital, uh, Persepolis, uh, back in the days of Darius and Xerxes uh, the Great. Uh, and this was the empire of empires in its day. This was the first real world empire. And so you have a hundred column uh, temple I'm sorry, Hall, uh, built a Persepolis in the 6th century BC. And these are now uh, found all over the Persian world. And this too is being imitated at Vijayanagara uh, in this, in this uh, 100 column hall, same idea. And then finally, probably the most renowned king of Vijayanagara, uh, Krishnaraya, uh, is depicted here in this bas-relief wearing what 
is called in Telugu a kulai, which is derived from the Persian word kola, which simply means headgear. And this was a style of headgear uh, that was very popular in the Persian world in the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries. And what you see here is the king uh, uh, publicly displaying himself uh, in, this is a, in a, a courtyard, uh, actually the Darwaza, the, the gateway to the, to the, the city of Raichur. Uh, so it's very public. And you see the king uh, very clearly displayed wearing this headgear, which is associated with, with Persian aristocracy, if not kingship itself. Indeed, the word kola, uh, as I said, is a Persian word. So it's another instance of how this Persian world is diffusing itself across India uh, having nothing to do with religion at all, but everything to do with a, a, a very prestigious style associated with Persian understandings of, of culture and power. If I may, I just have a further question about this particular freeze. Sure. Um, sure. You mentioned in the book that this is uh, an illustration of a scene from the Ramayana. Um, and you, you posit the question, is, um, is Krishna Raya here a Hindu deity or is he a Persian nobleman? Right. Uh, I was wondering what you, you could tell us what exactly is happening in this picture. What's happening is that I'm glad you asked that because directly opposite this, what you have to understand, this is part of a, of a, a courtyard with four sides. And on, on two or three of these four sides is the entire story of the Ramayana, where Rama himself is clearly depicted as king. And we know that because it, all the symbols associated with Rama are there. And it's part of a connected a number of other friezes which which depict the uh, uh, which Rama is there. Directly opposite that uh, is this image, which also happens to be facing a a, a jaroka, which is to say a uh, a raised portal where the king himself, Krishna Raya himself, would be seated. And and the way it's located in the courtyard, uh, you have. Uh, the, the, the deity Rama on one side embedded within a whole series of other images associated with a Ramayana epic. And on the other side, you had these secular images uh, of what is very clearly Krishna Raya himself. But he's, as I see it, the way it's, it's, he's positioned, he is, at, he is presenting himself not only as a king dressed up in a Persian headgear, but also as Rama himself, uh, and because obviously the rest of the, the courtyard is nothing but the Ramayana. So I think there's a certain double vision going on here. Uh, the king is having it both ways. He's presenting himself, the viewer can see him either as an incarnation of Rama, or he can see him uh, as, as a proper uh, Persian king. And it's, it's not one or the other, it's really both. And I, I think that that actually this graphical syncretism you're describing um, yeah. may be described very nicely by a quotation in your book, which is India in the 15th and 16th centuries was not so much a sacred realm, far less a zone of two mutually exclusive sacred realms as it was a crossroads. Exactly. And we see that crossroads in this very courtyard uh, where, we, where we, we have not only the Rama and the Ramayana epic story, but we also have obviously this, this notion of kingship. And the kingship, when you combine that with the architecture I just showed you, clearly uh, is drawing from these, these larger cosmopolitan Persian models. Nonetheless, yeah. uh, forgive me if I interrupted. Sure, that's um, quite all right. Yeah, go ahead. None nonetheless, I was going to say that leading on to your next uh, part of the presentation, these cosmopolitan cultures, these trans-regional uh, understandings of architecture and and uh, literary prestige, they did right. not, they did not, uh, they were not hegemonic. They didn't occupy universal space. Rather, um, regional cultures right. nonetheless persisted. And I think, I think that's, that's right. Now. That's right. And that's why I want to emphasize right here what it says on the slide. Despite this, this overarching reality of a Sanskrit world and a Persian world, both of them kind of uh, emerging with each other, there is still the persistence of regional cultures, that, that regional language do, do not disappear and get swallowed up by either Sanskrit or Persian, far from it. Uh, they themselves acquire their own literary status at this very time, which is fascinating. 
uh, that you get you get vernacular Tamil, vernacular Marathi, vernacular Bengali, Gujarati, Kashmiri, and so forth. All these languages are now appearing uh, in literary form in imitation of both Sanskrit and Persian models. But there is a there is a persistence of that regional culture, and the way we see that best is once again in architecture. Okay, here I want to. Both in Malabar and Bengal, to give you good, easy examples, uh, you have on the left-hand side. Uh, so, sorry, Professor Professor Eaton, if I just may, uh, just for context sake, could you please describe where precisely Malabar is? Um, I'm sure people know where Bengal is, but they might not be familiar with where Malabar is. Modern, modern day Kerala, southwestern coast, the pepper country, uh, with with long-standing historical uh, reaches into the, into the Indian Ocean and the Indian Ocean economy. Uh, but what's interesting to me is when we talk about Kerala or Malabar Coast, we have a style of regional culture which is expressed in both temples and mosques and it's very distinctive. And you see it there uh, both in this uh, Malakarjuna temple in Kasaragod in, in Kerala and also in the Mishkal Masjid in Calicut. And, and let's take an example. If we look at the Mishkal Masjid on the bottom left, what, yeah. is, what is regionally distinctive about that design? Well, the, the roof architecturally and engineering, you have multiple roofs uh, uh, with, which are used using either wood or tile. Uh, but the way in which these roofs overlap each other is very distinctively Malabari. You don't find it anywhere else in India, nowhere. Not nothing like quite like this. And um, would you see that same roof pattern displayed on other places of worship, yeah. like uh, mandirs, uh, for example? I yes, you would. This is a mandir. I mean, this is the uh, the, the Malakarjuna temple is a, is obviously a Hindu temple. Oh, forgive uh, me. I, I was discussing the the Mishkal Masjid below, but I suppose they are quite similar. They are, and and you can see the similarity architecturally. It's quite obvious. Uh, they, they have more similarity with each other than they do with either Hindu temples or Muslim mosques anywhere else in India. That's the point. The same is true in Bengal. If you look on the right hand side, uh, you see once again, there's a certain aesthetic vision that is typically Bengali. Uh, the, the curved cornice, for example, on the, uh, if you look at the facade, uh, you see there's a curve to it. It's not going straight across. Uh, you notice the heavily, the lots of terracotta images uh, and, and uh, kind of busy work on the facade uh, as well. And this idea of a curved cornice, uh, and indeed the temple and mosque are, could almost be exchanged. Uh, they are so similar. So my point simply being that these two trans-regional cosmopolitan cultures, the Sanskrit and the Persian, are always in dialogue with regional cultures. And the regional cultures never get thoroughly uh, extinguished. Quite the contrary, they all survive and, and they survive in, in most visibly uh, in these architectural forms. It, 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 Professor Eaton, I just, I have a bit of a, a, a macro question to ask about sure. why is it that some regional cultures persisted but others, um, uh, succumbed, as it were, to transregional influences. Was it because uh, particular sovereigns were um, very individualistic and they wanted to, they were keen to emphasize um, right. uh, their, their distinctive regional cultures? Can we can we explain this by virtue of um, the personalities of individual kings? I, I th probably we can. Uh, that's a fascinating question that may require a great deal of research, which I have not undertaken myself. But perhaps, a, that's a, that, perhaps that's a PhD in the waiting. I, I, several PhDs probably in the waiting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, to, to move along very quickly, because uh, I want to give time for Q&A, but uh, moving to the Mughal period, the, my book has a great deal to say about the, the kind of uh, cultural as well as political alliance between the Mughals and the Rajputs, which is clearly illustrated in this, in this contemporary image of, uh, of Surgeon Singh uh, submitting to Akbar in 1569. And it's, it's, this is one of the things that really stands out about uh, the Mughal period, as I think many of you are all aware, uh, is the extraordinary degree to which 
the Mughals from Akbar and then continuing after him uh, reached out to uh, the, the ruling dynasties across Northern India. Uh, and, and in that sense, they were behaving in very typically uh, ancient Indian tactics. You never annihilate the enemy. What you do is you try to appropriate the enemy and make yesterday's enemy into today's ally, uh, which is exactly what Akbar is doing, as you see uh, in, this, in, in this image. And now um, this, go, go ahead. Sorry, just, just this image, this is an image, um, to, could you just, this is an image from the Akbar Nama, right? It um, is. Could you just describe what precisely is happening in this image? What's happening is that, uh, that, that Surgeon Singh has agreed to become uh, a servant of the Mughal Empire, but on conditions. And the, and the conditions are, are very interesting to kind of elaborate on here. The Rajput kings were all allowed to, for example, continue patronizing their own culture the way they always had. Uh, they are still recognized as kings, which is what makes Akbar an emperor. He's a king of kings. Uh, he's not, that is to say, Surgeon Singh is still sovereign. Uh, he's still collecting taxes in his own area. Uh, he's given what they call, it was a Watan Jagir, or a, 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 in Mughal terminology, that is a territory over which uh, he is continuing to, to reign as a sovereign king. Um, obviously, he does not have to convert to Islam. Religion is completely left out of this equation. Unlike, say, the Ottoman Empire, where we're defeated. Um, pro Professor Eaton, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to move on to the next slide, just due to yes. time constraints. OK, right. Very quickly, then, this illustration, this slide is only I use this to illustrate uh, how the rapprochement between Rajput and Mughal was actually articulated in real time. Uh, what's extraordinary about this uh, Govinda Deva temple, which was built which was patronized by Raja Man Singh, uh, very high ranking Raja in the Mughal Empire. Uh, it's a good example of, of what has been called sub-imperial patronage. In other words, it was not Akbar directly who patronized this temple. It was the servant of Akbar, Raja Man Singh, who did so. Uh, and, but what's extraordinary is that you see all the characteristic features of classic Mughal architecture. Uh, the vaulting, the cross vaulting, the arches, uh, the domes, and so forth, the red sandstone, all of it. So you see here a, a merging of, of, of classic temple aesthetics with Persian aesthetics all coming together in this, in this one form. And this, I think, captures architecturally uh, the whole the major theme of the book, which is this, the, the, the way in which Sanskrit and Persian uh, cultures intermingle with each other. I suppose one very interesting thing you mentioned in the book, Professor Eaton, is that Akbar himself was very determined to um, associate his own empire with Vaishnava Hinduism. And I suppose exactly. that is that is reflected in, in institutions like this. Absolutely. Um, Vaishnava, not Shaivite, but Vaishnava. Yeah. That, was, sorry, that, that, uh, maybe it was a, a sound problem, but I, I did say that. Um, I think it's best if we go straight on to Aurangzeb, uh, Professor. OK, we'll go straight to Aurangzeb. Uh, now, Aurangzeb, I have a whole chapter on him. When you're writing a book on 800 years of Indian history, devote, to devote any one chapter to one person is extravagant in the extreme, because uh, you're trying to cover a lot of topics, a lot of issues. But I decided that, that, that Aurangzeb is such a radioactive, if not toxic, uh, figure in Indian history and Indian historiography, and certainly in popular culture, uh, that, that I needed to talk about him because he has been reduced to almost kind of a cardboard cutout figure. Uh, he's either demonized uh, as the greatest villain in Indian history, or he is praised uh, as this hero who tried to rescue Islam and all that kind of thing. And I, and I, and I thought that, the, that Aurangzeb needs to be reevaluated uh, in a very serious way. And I tried my best in this chapter to try to see him on his own terms and not to come to a determination of whether he was a good guy or a bad guy, because when you talk about good versus bad, then history becomes nothing more than a morality play. Uh, and, and that, I think, distorts the past.
My attempt was to try and understand Aurangzeb on his own terms. And I did that by starting the chapter by a number of vignettes, the, captured in this first instance by the particular one you see here. Uh, as a young man, I think he's only 14 years of age, uh, he is seen here uh, attacking an elephant. Now, Shah Jahan, his father, is in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, he and his eldest sons, Shah Shuja and uh, uh, Dara Shako and Aurangzeb, all three of them are on forces to come down to watch an elephant fight. Uh, you see the other elephant on the upper right. But what's happened is during this elephant fight, one of the two elephants forgot that he was fighting another elephant <laughs> and turned around and attacked the first horse that he saw, who happened to be Aurangzeb. And Aurangzeb, instead of running away, uh, takes his horse and he, he charges the elephant, which is an extraordinary act of courage, and he drives his lance into the, into the, into the head of this enormous beast, which caught the imagination of all the chroniclers, which is why this miniature was made. Now, what's interesting to me is the image not only shows the courage of Aurangzeb, but also on the lower left, you see the image of Dada Shako, who is simply watching from the sidelines. And to me, this image of, of Dara Shako and Aurangzeb, who became deadly enemies, of course, uh, is, is already kind of uh, foregrounded uh, in this early, in, in the personality of the two uh, men. Uh, Dara Shako being much more reserved, as we all know, inclined toward uh, reflection and philosophy and, and religious thought, whereas Aurangzeb was, was a man of action a brilliant commander, uh, and obviously very courageous, which is what you're, what you're seeing here. Uh, and here you see him on the right as a prince, probably when he was the governor of the Deccan, uh, and uh, juxtaposed with one of his many enemies. Uh, one of my favorite figures in Indian history, in fact, is the Maratha queen Tarabai, uh, who challenged Aurangzeb and actually defeated Aurangzeb on numerous occasions at his own game. Uh, she is the one who really initiated the whole advance of the Marathas northward into the Mughal Empire uh, toward the, uh, the end of the, uh, the beginning of the 18th century. But I'll simply close, Chapon, with this last image, which everybody knows. Um, uh, Professor yeah. Eaton, if, if I may, if I, may I, I suppose one thing that's very important to emphasize, and you make this point in your own book, is that Aurangzeb was distinguished because he wanted to... Um, somewhat depart from the model of sacred kingship that uh, Akbar and Jahangir and Shah Jahan had embodied themselves. Could you embody, uh, could you elaborate upon what that means and yes. what was distinctive about Aurangzeb's system of rule? Yes, uh, and I would go further. It wasn't just somewhat. I think he, he wanted to entirely depart from the tradition of sacred kingship which he had inherited. Beginning with Timur, and then going all the way through the, the, the Mughal dynasty, you have this idea that the king is some kind of a linchpin between, between heaven and earth. Uh, and that's certainly the way in which the common people looked up at the Mughal emperor. And with Akbar especially, but not just Akbar, also Humayun, his father, and with Babur, uh, you have this, you have, you're, they're, the, the Mughals are cultivating this ideology of the sacred king. Um, the one who takes it the furthest is Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan actually defines himself as the, the Sahib Qaran, which in Arabic means the, the, the Lord of Conjunction, uh, which was a title that was given to Timur himself. And Shah Jahan called himself the second Lord of Conjunction, right? Uh, the Sahib Qaran Sani in, in Arabic. Um, so he identified himself as something of a millennial figure. Uh, Shah Jahan was born in the year 1000 Hijri, which is it was, it was 1582 in the Christian calendar, 1000 in the Islamic calendar. So he thought that he was almost preordained and destined to have this career as a millennial king. The Taj Mahal itself, uh, built obviously to his queen, Mumtaz Mahal, uh, and himself, this, the Taj Mahal, is, is, is oftentimes represented as an image of paradise. Um, that the inscriptions around it reinscribe that notion. And 
it emphasizes the idea that the Mughal emperor, certainly Shah Jahan himself, is this touching point where heaven and earth meet. It was this self idea of the sacred king that drove Shah Jahan to actually try to reconquer Central Asia, the homeland of Timur, to articulate his claim to being the Lord, the second Lord of Conjunction. It was none other than Aurangzeb who was actually sent out on that campaign to conquer Central Asia. He got as far as Balkh and Badakhshan, uh, not quite to Samarkand. But Aurangzeb rejected, in my view, totally rejected this model of sacred kingship. Uh, and he embraced a very different philosophy, where, which was basically this idea of government under law, not under a sacred king. And the word Sharia in the 17th century and in the early 18th century as well did not mean, as we think today, exclusively Islamic law. It simply meant legal. It was Aurangzeb who patronized the codification of this, uh, of what was called the, the Fatawahi Alamgiri, which is this, uh, the law code of the Hanafi uh, Sharia. But it was a law code that was intended for use throughout the empire in Ghazi, uh, by Ghazis, by judges. And it was Aurangzeb who really attempted, I think he failed at it, but he attempted to establish an idea of kingship that was radically different from that of his father, Shah Jahan, and all the other Mughals. He failed. And the proof of that is that the people continued to call Aurangzeb Alamgir Zendapir, which it means in Persian, Alamgir, the living saint. Uh, and so the, the idea of the king, the Mughal king, still being uh, a touching point between heaven and earth persisted under Aurangzeb, even though Aurangzeb rejected it. So Aurangzeb, to my mind, is a, sense, a tragic figure. Uh, he built this magnificent mosque, the largest mosque in the world, uh, or certainly in India, uh, in, seven, in 1673 in Lahore, the Badshai Masjid, which symbolizes his patronage, obviously, uh, of the Islamic religion. But more important than that was his patronage of the idea of law uh, as, a, as something that would um, unify uh, all subjects of India. And it's very important to remember uh, that more Hindus than Muslims patronize these courts of the Ghazis because the Sharia simply meant legal. Uh, that's where you went to get your, your, your papers authorized. Uh, that's where you get documents stamped. Uh, that's where you get deeds notarized. Uh, in other words, the normal functioning of, uh, of administration at the most root level, the basic level, village level, was in these uh, uh, courts of Ghazis, village Ghazis, who were now administering law under this codified system that Aurangzeb had established. And I simply would close with that idea that, uh, that I think Aurangzeb needs to be completely rethought uh, and not simply be seen as the subject of a morality play of whether he's a good guy or a bad guy. We've heard enough of that. Uh, and I, I think I'm going to close with up on maybe we, this would be a good time to open up the the uh, the session for discussion unless you have other questions of your own um i i'm more than happy to uh let other people ask their own questions so um if anybody wants to ask a question um i'm not sure what the method is i think there's a button to say put your hand up or something and then i will unmute you um so if anyone wants to do that um, if anyone doesn't, there are a few questions in the um, uh, in the in the chat. First of all, from um, uh, Lou Fennec, who asks, "Isn't the kulla also associated with the Prophet Muhammad, Kaj kulla?" The kulla, uh, just to remind people in the audience, was the hat that uh, Krishna Raya was wearing. The, the tall um, Persianate. Uh, slash Islamic right. headdress. Right. Uh, Kula is not Arabic, so we do not find the word appearing in the Quran. 
Uh, it is a Persian word, pure Persian word, uh, but you use the word kajkola. And that is an interesting phrase because that comes from a poem by Jalaluddin Rumi. Kaj means tilted to one side in Persian. So kajkola is uh, has a deep kind of uh, cement, uh, wide semantic range of meaning, uh, but nothing dealing directly with kingship. Uh, but kula itself and taj kula, not kaj, but taj, uh, is a crown. So in that sense, it has a very specific royal meaning. If, if, if the questioner was using the word taj kula, then clearly, yes, that's, that's very much associated with kingship. But the word kola does not appear in the Quran, so it is not an explicitly Islamic idea at all. Um, Professor, I have a, sorry, there was just a, a, a comment in the, uh, that's from Lou. Okay, um, my, my question, I, I suppose, I want to Brian, try and um, address something to do with identity that you mentioned in the, in the book, which is right. that, um, that many of the regional identities that we associate with contemporary India, or not necessarily just contemporary India, but more recent India at least, whether it be the Rajputs, the, uh, the, the Sikhs, or the, the Marathas, you, you, you have this idea in the book that their own identities, their distinctions, uh, were brought about by the, di by the, um, the dialogue they had with, the, with this uh, Persianate uh, edifice. Uh, could you elaborate a bit upon that, please? Yes, uh, right, a, a major part of actually each chapter of the book, not each chapter, but at least in four chapters, four or five of the eight chapters, uh, I, I depart from a, a simple kind of political narrative and try to talk about the formation of new identities. Um, and the, you're right, I talk about the Marathas, I talk about the Sikhs, I talk about the Rajput. Let's just to conclude on. Let's talk about. Let, let's let's have two minutes discussing the the emergence of Sikh identity and its relationship with the with the period we're discussing. Okay. Uh, well, I I brought up the issue of the Sikhs, uh, obviously in the in the context of the coming of Babur. I mean, not Nanak and Babur happen to be contemporaries, and what what's extraordinary about the the early 16th century is you have a you have a new political dispensation with Babur at the same time you have a new religious dispensation with Nanak. So there's this remarkable coincidence, uh, and it's also important to remember that uh, with with a, with uh, I th by the time we come to Akbar, uh, the Mughal court is already uh, patronizing uh, the the Sikh establishment by essentially uh, reserving part of the land around Amritsar uh, as a, 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 a Watan Jagir. In other words, it's almost a state within a state uh, in a sense. So there is that kind of a connection as well. Um, on the other hand, one can argue, one needs to argue that Nanak obviously grew out of a, of a, a much earlier tradition of, of the Pati, of devotionalism, Mm -hmm. uh, in the same pattern of Tukaram and, and Tulsi Das and so many others. Uh, so there are obviously obvious parallels between the origins of the Sikh tradition and, uh, and other Bhakti traditions. Um, what's different, obviously, of course, is the dramatic way in which the Sikh tradition uh, uh, evolved further from a, from a kind of a, a typical Bhakti tradition into a a community, indeed a religious community. Uh, and how that happened, of course, is, is at least in part a function of its, of its historical connection with, uh, with the Mughals. And that's, I talk a great deal about that, beginning, of course, with uh, Jahangir uh, and, and his uh, uh, the execution you know, of the Guru. Same thing going on with Aurangzeb. Uh, but it's a complicated story because obviously the the, the Sikh community was in dialogue uh, with with Rajputs at the same time and Jats, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, they were Jats. There was an enormous influx of of the Jat community into the Sikh community, and 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 you have obviously uh, it's a complicated story, which I don't think we have the time to get into right here and now. But suffice it to say that. I think 
the, the, the Sikhs are one example of the evolution of new communities which emerge in the period that the book covers. And so part of my agenda in the book is to discuss precisely that, to, to think of history as something which needs to understand how it is that new identities emerge, which includes obviously the you know, Islamic identity in cases like Punjab or Bengal, uh, uh, the Maratha identity, which itself is not fixed, but is constantly changing uh, in the course of the, of the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, and Rajput identity. Uh, and because I think one of the, and I'll, maybe this is, I should end with this thought, that cultural identity is something which historians recognize as not being fixed in time, but constantly evolving and, 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 and recreating itself in a, in a way. And uh, that notion of identity as something which is uh, evolving and changing uh, is an idea that underlies the, the whole book. Final, the final question, uh, Professor Eaton, is in a sentence, what yeah. would be your takeaway recommendation for people looking on this period of Indian history? You mean recommendation of a book to read? Not, of course they should read your own book, but what I mean is, <laughs> what, I, what I mean is, if you were to give some kind of conceptual summary, what right. would it be of this period? I would, yeah, that, thank you for asking that. Um, to summarize it very briefly, it seems to me that my major objective in writing this book was to depart radically from the, the, the overworn, overwrought habit of thinking of pre-British history in terms of a clash of religions. I do not mean to wash out religion altogether and say that everything was just happy, happy, hunky-dory uh, in, in the pre-British period. But what I mean to say is that much of the thinking and writing about pre-British history, pre-colonial history, has been a projection of colonial or post-colonial understandings of society into the past. In particular, the partition of 1947 and the creation of Pakistan uh, had the consequence of politicizing religion, as we all know, uh, in ways that I think have distorted our understanding of the history of the pre-Islamic past. In other words, when it's, when it's taught in Pakistan, for example, that uh, Muhammad bin Qasim, who attacks Sindh in the, uh, in the early eighth century, is kind of the first citizen of Pakistan, that is a dramatic example of reading history backwards. Yeah. <laughs> and and what, I, what I want to do is move away from that and indeed move away from, from religion altogether and, and think of a different way of conceptualizing the past. And it seems to me that looking at literary traditions and the way in which literature informs culture is a much more um, realistic and a much more useful way of thinking about pre-colonial India. Uh, and that's that's how in one sentence that's what I would say. Um, so, uh, Camille has a question. Uh, okay, I, I suppose we we don't have time to take his question, but I know Camille personally. I will get his question. I will relay it to you later, Professor Eaton. Um, sure. Thank you so much for this absolutely magical talk. Um, it is truly enlightening and. Uh, it's always an, an enormous privilege to be able to talk about these fascinating issues with such distinguished scholars like yourself. Thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure. I want to thank you for making all this possible. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you to Jasveer and uh, all the other organizers of South Asia Heritage Month. And as he mentioned in the chat, uh, please do pay attention to other events taking place this month and uh, hopefully see you soon again, uh, maybe next year. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.